two. All right. Y'all come on in. We're waiting for a few moments. I'll give some announcements and we'll, uh, we'll get started. Let's get it started in here. Don't get me started, girl. All right. Jamie, you have everybody come on in. Let's get, let's get rolling. Let's get crack a lacking. What up, James Hendricks? They're all children? Oh, okay. All right, so uh, let me give you a few announcements before we get started. Um, first and foremost, Upward Basketball is starting. If you don't know what that is, that is a basketball program um, by which we take kids from first grade up through sixth grade. Uh, oh, yeah, I think through sixth grade at this point. Um, teach them the game of basketball, help them play tournaments and games, and then we teach them about the Lord while they're here. Um, we need a lot of volunteers for that, um, both for coaches, uh, cleanup crew, uh, referees, uh, people who will uh, do snacks and things like that. It's going to take all of us to make it happen. So if you're interested in volunteering, you can. Uh, there's a QR code in the connection zone, and uh, you can, or you can visit our website, and you're one click away from volunteering. Um, again, you don't have to know a thing about basketball to uh, to help volunteer. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, if you're going to volunteer, actually, yes, yes. I think all coaches, including parent coaches, have to do a background check, but I'm not sure. I'll check into that, but I'm pretty positive you do. Um, and again, a background check is only about, uh, it's not about your, we don't care what kind of other history you got with, with the police. Uh, all we care about is how you are with children. So, um, that will be, uh, it's normal, it's all nights of the week. So, uh, practices happen all, all different nights. And games are on Saturdays. So that's an eight-week program, and it takes, it's going to take everything the church has to make it happen. So uh, looking forward to that. September 11th um, is what we're calling Back to Church. Um, and so we're going to be asking you to invite all of your friends and family and uh, neighbors, anybody you have, to a special event here on the 11th, which is going to be a back-to-school, kind of get-back-to-church event. Uh, we'll have I me mean, if it's any good. Um, but hopefully you'll go, and it'll be great, and you'll want to stick around. So, uh, so make sure you check that out as um, soon as you can. So if, you'll do, if you're a veteran, if you'll complete the thing, the form outside, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, so tonight we're going to be doing, uh, we're talking about wisdom, and understanding even what you're saying to us tonight, and then we'd, we'd be willing and ready to search your scriptures to become uh, who you've called us to be, that we would be willing to apply the scriptures to our own lives, which is really what wisdom is all about. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, everybody got a pen? If you don't have a pen, uh, raise your hand. Jamie will bring you a pen. You're going to need a pen for the first thing we're going to do. So if you don't have a pen, raise your hand. If you don't have a sheet of paper, anybody not have the handout for tonight? Anybody not have the handout? Everybody's got the handouts. Okay, there's two of them. Everybody got a pen? Okay, I feel like somebody's just going, I'm not going to do it anyway, Pastor, so... We all need to be doing this together. All right, so you have two minutes. That's all you get. You get two minutes. You'll find on one of your sheets of paper, it's not the big sheets, it's the little ones. On the second page, you will see a complete the dot, or uh, what do you call it, dot to dot picture. You have all of two minutes to try and complete the task. Some of you say, Pastor, it's too small. I can't see the numbers. Yeah, well, that's your problem. Okay. The goal is, can you complete it in less than two minutes? You ready? Set, go. If you're coming on in, grab your sheet, grab a pen, start, start uh, doing complete the dot, uh, the complete the dot picture. Yes, it is important that you try, no matter how quick, how late you start. Two minutes, minute and a half now. <clears throat> if you just got in, grab the sheet that has the picture of the face of whatever that is. Start doing the dot to dot, fill in the, or what is it, paint by numbers. Start it out. If you're coming in, go ahead and go, turn to the sheet, paint by numbers, and uh, start doing it. You got one minute to finish the whole thing. 
Stay in the middle. Well, I, they don't need to see me while we're doing this. I'm just, you can, don't worry about me. And I don't know, but I'm not that good looking. Where's my wife? Let her come up here. Miss Jilda, second page. Go ahead and start doing that paint. Just start drawing that picture. You got, uh, you got all of 30 seconds to try to figure out where number one is because it's pretty small writing. I knew we should have started later. Yeah, but he came in later. Emmanuel, go ahead and grab the second sheet with the pictures on it and try to start connecting the dots to draw that picture. You got all of 20 seconds to do the whole thing. You, you better hurry. <clears throat> I have no idea. You better just you better have glasses. If Listen, if you can't see this, my wife's an eye doctor. Make an appointment. <laughs> shameless, shameless. All right, pens down. Here we go. Pens down. Who uh, who think they did pretty good? Who uh, who? Anybody finish? You y'all finished? Way to go. Let me. I want to see. Bring it up here. Come on, bring it up here. I can't come back there. Will says I have to stay in the shot. So bring it to me. I want to see it. Where's seventy four at? I don't have a clue where seventy four is. By the way, just to show you what kind of great teacher I am, I didn't even try this at home, so I don't even know what it looks like. Yeah, ho hopefully it's not you know some. Obscene thing. Which one's yours? This one's mine. That one's yours. All right. Man, that's pretty good. Oh, whose is this one? Yeah, well, he, he, he missed a couple right there. He, the, 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 he has a hole in his neck. He must have got shot in the neck. Here. Tell him, he's, tell him complete the neck, otherwise we were bleeding out. All right. That's going to be important because you all are going to help me later. Uh, in the, later in, in tonight, I'm going to need both of your, your guys to help me uh, as we do the final part of tonight. So tonight we're talking about wisdom, wisdom literature. Uh, in Hebrew wisdom, uh, it's a category of, the category of literature that is unfamiliar to most present day Christians. Though a significant portion of the Old Testament is devoted to wisdom writings, contemporary believers sometimes either misunderstand or misapply the material um, and so they miss the benefit of what God was trying to say in the very beginning. And so, look, I, I've given you a, a, a bunch uh, of notes. I, I didn't want to finish this class different than I did before. So I gave you the notes which really um, line out what, uh, what the book says about wisdom literature. We're not going to go through it all. Um, just wanted, I want to uh, show you a couple things to make sure you don't miss them. Um, for instance, a lot of you do wisdom at home whether you know it or not. Uh, we, whenever a parent... Uh, gives a child a rules to live by, like don't play in the street or try to choose good friends. That's wisdom. Uh, you may not think of it that way, but you're trying to tell your children something small that they'll remember that has greater applications later in their life. Um, Proverbs um, are big for us because we not only use them in, in our homes, we lose, use them in the church, and we use them in society. So I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that in just a moment um, as I'm going to ask you to tell me what were some wisdom Actually, let's do it now. What are some wisdom um, things or sayings that your mom and dad said to you at home? Any? Y'all got any? <laughs> Don't touch the stove. That's just a saying. What you got? Make sure you get an education. Now, what's funny is, is some people would say an education is you can get education on the streets. So what did mama mean? If you don't know what your mama meant, then you can turn that into anything you want to turn it into, right? And that's the problem with Scripture. If you don't know what the writer was talking about, people can take it and mean, make it mean, oh, see, what the writer meant was, is you don't need to go to school, you just need to make sure you're always learning, right? So they can turn it into anything else. What, what, tell me one. Well, no, 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 wait, say the saying again. Don't enter a room <laughs> like a donkey without a rope. All right. What? Wait, wait, wait. Don't tell us what it means. Anybody know what that means? Let, let's make something up. Nobody, don't ever enter a room like a donkey without a rope. Somebody tell me what it means other than him. Like a bull in a china closet. Okay. So in other words, don't enter it, uh, don't enter it uh, uh, without thinking through it. All right. What, what does it mean? So it means whenever someone's older than you, go and shake their hand. 
Would anybody have figured that out? No way. Oh, is that in the is that in the Proverbs? Oh, that's even funnier. So, you know, if you don't if you don't have a clue about mama or daddy or grandpa or whoever's saying it, you don't know what that means. Here's one for you. My dad told me all the time, go play in the street. It's funny, in the book, one of the examples is don't play in the street. My dad always told me, go play in the street. What do you think it means? You ready? Here's what I think it meant. Ready? Here's what I think it meant. I, I think it meant go play in the street where you can dodge cars because if you don't get out of my face, you won't be able to dodge what's coming. Is that what it meant? Close. Because I, look, and, and see what's him because I would be bugging him and he'd be like, dude, get out of the house. But instead of saying all of the things he wanted to say, he would just go, go play in the street. Now, other parents would hear it and they'd go, you want your kids to get run over? That's, and that's not what he meant. He meant, if you don't leave, I'm going to kill you. Which, by the way, is biblical. Isn't that what God told to Israel? Go on to the Holy Land. I'm not going with you because if I go, what? I'm going to kill you myself. So my father, I didn't know how biblical my father was, but there it is. And so um, as we walk through this, you need to understand all of us use wisdom all the time. Now, we, not, we might not pay much attention to it. We might not follow it, but we hear it all the time. Um, there are some things that I want to remind you of, like parallelisms. Um, in, in Scripture, a lot of times you will see thing, parallelism is when something is said twice that um, uh, reiterates the first saying. Um, so like we sing a song, your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness stretches to the sky. That's a parallelism. So it's saying the same thing two different ways, right? So that type of parallelism is called synonymous parallelism, where you're saying the same thing, just using different words. Then you have something called antithetical uh, parallelism, which is you would say the same, you would say two different things, which mean the same thing. So you'd say the opposite in order to make the point. And then you have synthetical, which is the two things aren't even related, um, but they still teach the same point. And so it's, it's a Hebrew poetry called parallelism. Uh, we, we might talk about that tonight simply because one of the passages I read that we so often um, abuse in the Proverbs and in the wisdom literature is a parallelism. So I wanted to make sure you understood that. Um, and so really the main thing I want you to catch tonight about wisdom literature is this, is that wisdom literature is, is what, or wisdom is what we do, is how we skillfully apply God's word to our life. That's what wisdom is. So we take God's word and we skillfully apply it to our own lives. And so you've heard that the difference between wisdom and knowledge is that wisdom is, or knowledge is, is knowing something. Wisdom is taking what you know and applying it. Right? So there are a lot of people who know a lot of things, and they're really stupid. And what I mean by stupid is, is they're foolish. They're unwise. They know everything, but they don't apply it to their life, and therefore they don't know what to do with it. We sometimes say those people don't have any common sense. And so really tonight what I want to do is I just want to walk through um, some of these things so you can see them with your own eyes. And so on the second sheet, the first sheet again is just so that you can, you can read through it at home. I think I did it in such a way that uh, you can kind of see it. And by the way, if you'll go home, all of them have examples that we pull those things from in the scriptures. So you can do some study at home. Uh, but tonight I want to talk about a few things through the, through the Proverbs and through the wisdom literature. Um, so most, most wisdom literature, when we think of that, is found in a few places. One is Proverbs. Uh, one is some of the Psalms. Uh, Job. Ecclesiastes, uh, and, what, and the Song of Solomon, right, or the Song of Songs. So those are normally where we get those from, and you'll find that in your notes. Um, uh, for, the, for the most part, Proverbs is, is just sayings. Uh, a lo Job is a dialogue between other people where the, you can look at the dialogue to find the wisdom, and sometimes that wisdom is done in, in, an, in a synthetical way. In other words, done in, in such a way that you would think they're saying something about God that's not true, but what they were doing is asking a question like, can God make a mistake? Oh, God can make a mistake, right? right? And so it's really not saying that God does. It's saying they're dialoguing through it. Then you have Ecclesiastes, which really is all about how, matter of fact, Ecclesiastes reminds me of me, where God always says to me, John, don't you know you're going to die? Why do you care what people think about you? Just live your life for me. 
So Ecclesiastes is all about how this life is uh, meaningless if you live it for yourself because it's all going to end. And so live your life for the glory of God. And so the wisdom in, found in Ecclesiastes is things that, like live your life for God uh, knowing that your end is coming here. All right, so we're going to look at three um, th or three or four subjects tonight. The first one is the one I promised we'd look at, which is wealth. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of prosperity gospel going around in, in our world, um, which is where people use Proverbs, they use the Psalms, uh, they even use some passages from Jesus when he says, you know, you need to take this and shake down, press together, and it's all about money, money, money. And so I wanted to start with Proverbs 28, 25. Here's what it says. It says, an arrogant man stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will prosper. Okay. Somebody real quickly, tell me what that means. A man who, let me read it again, an arrogant man stirs up strife, but the man who trusts in the Lord will prosper. Somebody quick, go. What? Okay, and the second part? Okay, so he's saying it's, it's, he's taking the word strife, which is a really good idea. He's taking the first thing, in which, again, this is a parallelism. The man who is uh, full of strife will have no friends, and the one who has no strife or, or, or trust in the Lord, he will have plenty of friends. Now, can that be what he's meaning? Sure. Now let me change the word and see if it changes the meaning for you. Because if you read it in the Hebrew, here's what it actually says. An arrogant man stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be made fat. There are some trusting folks in this room today. <laughs> you don't like when I say things like that, but it's funny. Um, here's the thing. It, it can mean a lot of things, but it, you, know what it's, you know what it's probably not about? Money. It, th those folks normally weren't, weren't rich in money anyway. They were rich in land. They were rich in, in food, which is why, by the way, they became fat. Um, and, and they were, if, if you were stirring up strife, you were fighting. What do you know about people who fight a lot? They're not fat. Matter of fact, if you, if you fight a lot and you don't win, uh, you starve. Like if you lose a war, you're going to be a servant, not a, not a master. Servants are skinny, masters are fat. And so if, uh, if, you tr if you're always causing problems then you're not going to have peace. That's what that's about. Let's go on, but my point is it's not about wealth, as we would consider wealth. Proverbs 3, 13 through 15, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom, and a man who gains understanding. For her profit, her profit, that's wisdom, the profit of wisdom is better than the profit of silver, and her gain is better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. What does this passage say about money, about wealth in general. It's not about the money. If you find wisdom, if you, can find, if you can figure out how to apply God's truth to your life, it will do more for you than all the money, all the food, and all the stuff that this world has to offer. Does that sound like prosperity gospel? No. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay, so this is, is the defense of those who have money, those who have stuff, those who have food, those who are at peace. It's okay to be wealthy. It's okay to work hard and have good stuff and have nice things. It's okay. Just know this. You better honor God with your wealth. By the way, it doesn't say honor God with your wealth if you have a lot of it. Whatever it is you have, honor God with it. If you've got a little, then be faithful in the little. And what does the scripture go on to say? If you're faithful in the little, he will make you faithful over much. And so it doesn't say honor him if you're rich. It says whatever you have, honor him with it. And from the first of the produce, what does that mean? It means your tithe. Make sure that you honor God with the first parts of, your, of everything you get so that God knows that you know it's not yours anyway. It's his. So if, let me just encourage you. If you're not tithing today, if you're, if you're one who goes, well, I, I just don't have the money to tithe, let, let, me, just, let me give you a, a scenario that happened in our church when I first got here. 
I moved here, came to this church, uh, and the church wasn't doing very well financially and certainly not with a lot of numbers. And so we weren't tithing as a church. So the church was giving away 2% of all that the church brought in. And we were renting the building every chance we got because we really didn't have the money. When I came, one of the first things I said is, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to rent the building anymore because this is God's house, not our house. Number two, we're no longer, in other words, we're not going to uh, rely on, on the world to pay the bills. And number two, from now on, we're tithing 10%. And they were like, Pastor, I don't know that we can afford that. I said, I'm telling you right now, we can't afford not to. And so immediately upon coming here, we started tithing 10% to missions, 10%. So the first year, we gave exactly 10% to mission. The second year I was here, we gave 20% of everything we brought into missions. <laughs> to this day, we give more than 10% for sure. But here's what's happened in the last four and a half years. The finances of the church has gone up. The membership has gone up. The, the spirituality of the church has gone up. And we have become family. Why is that? It's because we, were, we honored God with the wealth. And so I just want to encourage you. It's okay to have wealth. It's okay to have money. It's okay to have stuff. But make sure you're honoring God with it. Because the Bible doesn't say anything about God's going to make you rich. Here's what it does say. If he allows you to be rich, honor him with your riches. And if he allows you to be poor, what allows me? Yes. If he allows you to be poor, then honor him even in your poverty. Okay. Uh, and the answer, the reason, so that your barns will be filled with plenty. Filled with enough. We think of plenty as being all that we ever want. No, that's not the key. The plenty is all that you need. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And finally, Proverbs 10.4, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. In other words, if you're not working, get to work. I mean, really, it's not hard. It's, it's one thing to say I trust in God. It's another thing to say I trust in God, but I ain't going to do nothing. I'm just going to wait for him. Look, we're all called to work. Matter of fact, the Bible goes on to say if a man don't work, a man don't eat. And so we need to be diligent people. The Bible says uh, that when we, serve, when we serve in this world, we should serve as unto the Lord. And so we need to be hard workers. Working hard to feed our families. Uh, we had someone not too, too long ago that was here and they couldn't feed their family and they were like, I don't know what to do. I said, how many jobs you got? One. Get another job. I, I wouldn't be able to see my kids. I said, listen, I love, I, I love that you want to be with your kids, but hear me closely. A man that doesn't provide for his kids is worse than a heathen. And so do whatever you have to do to provide for your children, to provide for your family, and then trust the Lord with the rest. Have a plan Stick to it, and then trust that God will bring you on and bring you out. All right, so what, what does the New Testament teach about these things? Because my point in the Old Testament was to show you that all these passages that might be used for wealth really aren't about you getting rich. The New Testament, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, reads this way. Instruct those who are rich in this present world, okay, to do something. Let me just help you real quick. He's not going to say anything about not being rich. <laughs> Jesus told the rich man, do what? Take, get all your money and give it where? To the poor. Well, Paul's not going to say that. Or Peter's not going to say, Timothy, Paul's not going to say that to Timothy. Here's what I'm going to say. If you're rich in this present world, don't be conceited and don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of your riches. But instead, fix your hope on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and be ready to share. God wants us to have whatever it is he gives us. He wants us to have it. But know this, he doesn't want you to have it with a closed hand. He wants you to have it with, a, with an open hand. Being willing to share, being willing to love, being willing to take care of people, live a life of love as Christ loved us. And so he doesn't say you can't be rich. He just says don't, don't put your eyes on that. It's not about that. It's about doing good so that others might know him. So stirring up for themselves the treasure of good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So you can have all the money in the world and if you die, that money's not going to help you. But if you have all the money in the world and you're sharing Christ and helping people, then your money could have been to good use of people knowing the Lord. And so here's my point. When it comes to your wealth, when it comes to your riches, Wherever God has you, whether you be rich, poor, look, some of you are poor because of poor, foolish choices. And if you would apply the scriptures to your life, I gave you one tonight. 
right? Tithe. Make sure that you honor God with whatever he gives you, whether that be of he's given you plenty, then honor him in the plenty. If he's given you barely anything, then honor him in the barely anything. And if you'll do that, God's going to take care of you, right? Now, so that's, that's where you want to start. Where you want to end with, it, with the, the wealth thing is, is this, wherever he has you is where he wants you today. Work, have a plan to get out of it, but be content, as Paul would say. I've learned how to be content having a lot, and I've learned how to be content having nothing. Be content in the fact that your name is written in the book of life. That's what the gospel is really all about. Any questions on wealth as far as wisdom goes? All right, let's go on. Healing. First of all, let me, let me answer a question before we even get started. Does God still heal people miraculously? There is no healing outside of miracles, y'all. In Amer- only in America do we think medicine's not miraculous. Only in America do we think God somehow doesn't come down and do crazy mir- miraculous things unless you're in some Pentecostal church. I went to Africa and learned the easy way, that God is still in the miracle business. And so he still has absolute, has the ability and the desire to heal people, but not on our time and not because of our desires. He, his healing or non-healing all deals with his plan and his glory, not our plan and our glory. So with that in mind, let's read some Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 7 and 8. It says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It, it will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Okay. So here's what this proverb teaches. Are you sick? Are you hurting? Do you need some healing? Let's start here. Where are we going to start? Let's start by fearing God and turn away from evil. (laughs) In other words, repent of your sins. Stop living for yourself. Because here's what you need to catch, and it's all throughout the Scripture. Sometimes we're, we're sick, not because God wants to keep us sick, but because we're living our life outside of His plan, and He allows sickness in order to get our attention. And so one of the things that God uses in order to heal us is when we repent. When we turn back to him and fear him um, or, or respect him and honor him for who he is. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says, Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. So this is about Jesus. This is a prophetic word about Jesus written 700 plus years before Jesus was born on the earth. It goes on to say, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. So, catch, this is, this is one of the, this is, no, not one of, this is the major verse that is used throughout Prosperity Gospel. Help, by the way, Prosperity Gospel, if you don't know, is when people teach that if you give your life to Jesus, you can declare whatever you want to declare in Jesus' name and he'll give it to you. You want to be healthy? Declare that in Jesus' name. You want money? Declare that in Jesus' name. It's also the people, by the way, who also say, ooh, don't be speaking that, that you'll bring life to it. Look, you can't, you're not a life giver. Did you know that? I'll tell you what you are. You are a death bringer. The Bible says with the same tongue, we both bless God and curse men. And so we bring death with the tongue. But you don't have, the only way you bring life with your tongue is to speak God's word, right? It's not your words that matter. It's His words that matter. And so as we walk through this, you need to catch, this is the number one passage used by people who are naming and claiming the kind of people. And so they say, by his wounds or by his stripes, we are healed. And so what what they mean by that is because Jesus died on a cross and gave us authority, now because of that, we can just claim our, our independence from our sickness. Well, that's to say that you're in charge of your life. Are you in charge of your life? I'm not. As a matter of fact, I gave that up when I gave him my life. I'm not in charge of my life. Um, now, he does say anything I ask in his name, he'll do, right? But what does in his name mean? In his name means by his authority. So when my prayer, the point of purpose of prayer is to a- align my will with his will. God already knows what he wants to do. When I agree with him, he does it. So prayer is to align my will with his so that what I speak is not on my authority, it's on his authority so that I can actually say in Jesus' name I pray. So when you send your kids on a trip, on a field trip, and they say you got to sign the, the, uh, the permission slip. As a youth pastor, many times people would send their kids without a permission slip. <clears throat> and so I'd call the parent and I'd say, hey, we don't have a permission slip for your son. 
And they say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't come down there. Can you sign it for me? And I say, yes. And I would read it to them, and I would say, do you give your approval? They would say, yes, I do. And then I would sign my name slash what? Their name. So I signed in their, come on, in their name. And so you've got to ask Jesus, what's your plan, God? What are you doing? And when he tells you what he's doing, then you can speak what he's already speaking. And when you do that, then your words have authority because you're not saying it in your name, you're saying it in his name. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is the number one passage people use to say, well, you can declare anything you want to declare. Because, listen, God doesn't want you to be sick. God doesn't have a plan for sickness. That's the devil's job. Look, the devil certainly does sickness work. But God turns all things and works them together how? For good, for those who love God and call according to his purpose. If it weren't for some sickness in my life, I wouldn't have repented in my life. If it weren't for some sickness in my life, I wouldn't even know how to, how to deal with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says that God comforts us through all of our struggles so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we receive from God. So God allows sickness for a reason, so that he can heal us. But you know, one of the reasons for sickness is so that you can die. Did you catch that? The Bible says precious... In his sight are the death of his saints. It's precious to him. We're like, oh, we lost her again. We lost another one. God's like, I gained her. It's precious to him. Because this earth is not all there is. So stop living like it is. That's what Ecclesiastes is about, by the way, wisdom literature. And so um, it's important that as we look through it, we catch it up. going on. Let me look at the New Testament now. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20 says... Uh, Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. He was a pastor. What in the world is that about? I just wanted to prove to you, uh, Paul was an amazing man of God. He is the reason we talk about naming and claiming it. Because, man, Paul would just walk up to somebody in the name of Jesus, get up, woo, and they get up and walk. And other people didn't even have to be touched by Paul. Paul would walk down the street, the shadow of Paul would come over them, and they would be healed. Paul had all kinds of authority, and you, you know what he did? He left Trophimus sick on the road to Miletus. If a man can declare anything he wants to declare in Jesus' name, why did Paul, the greatest of all of them, why did he leave somebody sick? Because God has a plan that sometimes doesn't include your physical healing today, although it always includes your healing for eternity. So by his wounds you are healed. That literally means that one day you will die and sickness will no longer have any control over your life. But God has a plan even for your sickness. Revelation chapter 21, 4, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Oh, the pain. I'm in pain today because the rain's coming. My knees are killing me. Heaven ain't gonna be like that, amen? The first things have passed away. And so Jesus tells and, and, and tells John in, in, the, in the book of Revelation that the day is coming when heaven will begin. There will be no more death, no more sickness, no more nothing, even in the Garden of Eden. Remember there was a tree, there were two trees, special trees in the middle, right? One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they weren't supposed to eat from. The other was the tree of life that had 12 different types of fruits on it, right? So what was that tree supposed to do? It's supposed to give life. If, they would have been, if there would have been anything that could have caused harm, the tree would have healed it. There's going, in heaven, there will be no sickness. We don't even need the tree of life, but watch this. Even if we did, it's there. There will be no death, no sorrow, no sickness, nothing in heaven because when God is there and sin is no longer present, there will be no longer any sin and any sickness. And then, um, oh, I, already, I already said Proverbs, uh, Psalms 116. So precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints or the death of his godly ones. And so that's, that's really what the Bible declares. And so we have the wisdom literature that speaks to those things. Oh, and I think uh, I, I forgot to tell you, so let me go back. Um, back to the Old Testament that uh, by his wounds were healed. You know, one of the things I realized as I was walking through this in Isaiah 53, that is a parallelism. And so if you go back and look at it real quick, it says he was... Um, he was crushed for our iniquities. By his stripes, we are healed by, his, by the punishment. So all of those things are parallelisms where they mean the same thing, right? You say one, it's got to align with the other. And they weren't, he weren't, they weren't talking about some physical healing. They were talking about our sin being taken care of. 
And so we were being healed or saved from our sin. I feel like I, I left the by his stripes we were healed off of here. But you can go look it up uh, the same way. Um, so let me, uh, so any questions about healing from what we talked about? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, okay. So how do, people, how do people misuse if you have the faith of a mustard seed? Um, you'd be able to move a mountain. Here's the thing. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And faith, not of yourself, but a free gift of God, not by works so no man can boast. So people will go, you know, people, you can go into a place and see a, a man that's huge, right? Got muscles everywhere. And he can say, look, I did all this myself. But who gave him the muscles to do it? If you didn't have a muscle to start with, you can't grow the muscle. And in the same way, faith is a gift of God, whether it's salvific faith or if it's faith to be healed or faith to move. Whatever faith you have, faith doesn't come from you. Faith is believing in something you don't see and the assurance of something that... Uh, or the, in, oh, man. I, the substance of things not seen, right? And so everything about faith is not about you. It's about what God gives to you. And so in the same way, um, any time that we believe God for something and we don't quit asking, that says something about who, what God's doing, not what I'm doing. Because I think I've told you all this before, but when I go to Walmart, uh, if I see something that I really want, if I, told you, I know I've told you this before. If I see something I really want, my wife says, if you want it next time, you can have it. And I'm always like, that's mean. Because I know why she says it. Because the next time I go, I'm going to want something different. And so she just keeps that up. If you want it next time, you can have it. If you want, because when I see it, I want it. But if I want it again and again and again and again, I never stop asking, what does that mean? It means it's something I really desire. And the Bible says, if you really desire something of God, that doesn't come from you. No man seeks the Lord. No, not even one. And so when we desire something from God, for God, to the glory of God, those are things not from us but from God. And when we continue to ask, it's not because we're such good people. It's because God has put faith in us that's even bigger than a mustard seed that won't, just, it won't stop until it, until it completes the task it was set for. Does that make sense? So that's what I would say to that idea. Because what we want to say is somehow, oh, I got enough faith, I can move a mountain. Look, if God needed the mountain moved, he would tell you to move it. That's just not normally what God does. It was more of what God was trying to say to them that they would never imagine. And so um, faith comes from God. It doesn't come from you. So if, if you ever pray for someone and they get well, and you're like, oh, man, I just kept praying. I kept believing. That wasn't you. It was God. God is the one who does those things. He does it in and through the lives of believers. Anything else on healing? Yes. Absolutely. Here's the thing, though. I want you to make sure you catch this since we're doing exegesis and hermeneutics through this whole class, right? What did it mean for the original hearer? When Jesus said it to uh, his disciples, what was happening? Anybody remember? Dr. J.K.? What was happening in the disciples' lives when he said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed? God had done a miracle that they couldn't do. And he said, look, if you just have the... And so he was probably pointing at the mountain. The, the hermeneutics of that is absolutely it can mean anything because we all have mountains in our lives. We have problems in our lives. But his point wasn't the mountain moving because the mountain moving is crazy. His point was if whatever I put in you, it ain't even got to be much because when God puts it in you, it's big enough to do anything. I mean, we want God. God, do huge things in my life. Listen, I love saying this. This is one of my favorite sayings from one of my former sermons. Um, what is... God doesn't know how to do normal things because he's supernatural. There's no such thing as natural for God. What's funny is we want God to do, oh, God, make lightning happen right now. That's natural to him. I mean, that's not big. That's nothing to him. God can move. So, so a mountain for us is supernatural. And yet God spoke a word and the mountains were created. And so we, we think we ask asking too much of God. 
But when your will aligns with his will, you, there's nothing you can't ask that he can't do. And so whatever it is, if God wants it moved, it can be moved. You just got to allow God to be the one that gives you the faith and stop trying to muster up. In other words, let the faith of the mustard seed be in you from Christ instead of trying to muster up some faith. Doesn't work that way. All right? Anything else? By the way, does that mean you should not pray your own selfish desires? No, it sure doesn't. Jesus prayed his own selfish desires, didn't he? I mean, I love the fact that it wasn't selfish in the fact of a sin, but Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he pray? Man, look, Lord, if there's any way we can do this a different direction, take this cup from me. Watch this. Watch this. But not my will, but your will be done. So he aligned his will with God. And then he went back, and the soldiers came, and, and they started the fight, and Jesus had the faith of a mustard seed. He had the faith in him that it was time to die. And he says to John and, and to Peter, or to Peter, James, and John, he says, put the sword away because whoever lives by the sword will die by the sword. And he wasn't going to die by a sword. He was going to die on a cross. So he had already submitted to the will of God. And so you and I need to do the same thing. So if God wants you to have cancer, and I know, look, here's, here's how you know who's prosperity gospel. Somebody would say, God would never want you to have cancer. Something's going to kill you. Did you know that? Something's going to kill you. It, who knows what it, God knows what it'll be. That's it. But whatever it is, God has a plan for it to not only glorify himself, but to somehow grow you and to teach others about his glory from the way you, you deal with your situation. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So uh, that's kind of where we, where we come off on healing and what the scripture says about healing. Any other questions on that? All right, let's move on. Um, how about just some bad theology um, coming from <clears throat> the Proverbs? Train a child in the way he should go, and when he gets old, he will not depart from it. Man, I heard, I've heard this my whole life. And what normally people think this means is if you raise your child in the church to be a Christian, they'll be a Christian. Don't you wish that was true? Man, I wish that was true. Here's another way people think it means. If you raise your child to be a basketball player. They'll be a good basketball player. It's not what this passage means. What this passage means is that God has a plan for everybody's life. He has a special design for every single one of us. And when parents get on God's page, God, what do you have for my child? Your kid's not going to seek the Lord yet. You need to seek the Lord on behalf of your child. God, what do you have for this, not for my children, but for this child, what do you have? And when God tells you how he specifically designed or he shows you through something they do that they're talented in this area, then you teach them to do it as unto the Lord. And if you train the child in the way that they should go, how should we go? The way God wants us to go, right? He will direct your path. And so you find out where they're supposed to go, you lead them down that path, and here's the assurance. If you lead them in the direction God wants them to be, they won't depart from it. But way too often, parents are trying to live vicariously through their children and getting their kids to do all these things they couldn't do or that they were so great at. I, mean, I wanted my kids all my life to play basketball because I was, I was really good at basketball. So I wanted my kids to be great at it. So I pushed, and I realized real quickly that pushing was not going nowhere. My kids didn't like basketball, and they really weren't very good at it. And so I have tried very hard to, to back up and say, okay, maybe it's not sports, maybe, and then figure out what they like, what they're good at, and how, they, if they can use it for the glory of God. My prayer is, is that when they're older, they won't depart from that. By the way, have you ever heard anybody um, start going to church after a funeral? Uh, we've got a couple folks here that didn't really come to church here until they buried one of their loved ones here in this church, and now they come to church all the time. Why is it? It's because things they were taught as a child have now returned to them, and now they're like, I need to be in church, and I know it. So God uses the, the death of his saints to bring back the children who were raised the correct way. So uh, any questions on that verse? Because listen, that is a very misused verse, somehow thinking that just because you think your kids, I'm going to raise them to be a Christian. They, that may mean they don't leave the church, but it doesn't mean they're going to be a Christian. All right, um, how about fear? Let's talk about fear for just a second. Proverbs 28, 14, this is just a good example of how you could misuse a passage. How blessed is the man who fears always, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. <laughs> how many of you have, a, have anxiety issues? Oh, man, y'all are blessed. 
Isn't that what it says? If you fear, ooh, if you fear all the time, oh, you're blessed. Isn't that, isn't that what it says? Don't lie. That's what it says. I'm going to read it again. Read it again. I'm just talking about at face value. If you didn't read the second part of the parallelism, it says, blessed is the man or woman who fears all the time. But read on. But he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Now, obviously, if you read the rest of it, he's talking about the fear of God. You're not talking about fear of man. You're not talking about fear of your bills. Matter of fact, the Bible says that, oh, wait, matter of fact, that's the second part. I know I'd put it in here. New Testament says, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. If you have a fear of God, that is from God. If you got a fear of anything else, that's not from God. You need to rebuke that thing. God didn't want, doesn't want you to be afraid. Now, if you are afraid, I love Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't share in the fear or share in the anxiety any longer. But by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, simply let your request be known to God. So don't share in it. You, man, I, I'm scared for my kids. They're, they're old and they don't love Jesus. Look, you did your job. Keep living your life for Jesus. Surrender your children back to the Lord and say, God, it's your problem. These are your kids. I submitted them to you. By the way, if you want to commit your children to the Lord, we're doing that on September the 4th. That Sunday, we're, we're going to dedicate children to the Lord. So if you've not done that and want to, you can do that. That's the day that we give our children, no matter how old they are, and we say, God, they're now your problem. <laughs> I'm going to raise them the way I need to raise them, but God, these are your issues now. And so I'm going to trust you with my children. And so um, we should not be afraid of anything but the Lord. It is the fear of God that we always must have. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So before we even talk about wisdom, you need to know this. You can't even be someone who, who uh, uh, applies the scriptures to your life until you first realize you are not God. And God controls all things. So you, there should be a healthy respect and some amount of fear when it comes to God because he is who he is. Any questions on fear? I just did a quick one just so you'd catch that. All right, I, I, in, the, in the spirit of Arsenio Hall, I have things that make you go, hmm. Proverbs 28, 9. He who turns away his ear from listening to the law, even his prayer is an abomination. <laughs> let, me, let me break this down for you. When my children come into my house and I, I begin to tell them things they're supposed to do and they talk back to me and, and, and they talk smack to me and, and, and they don't treat me with honor and respect and they turn their back on what I've told them to do and they walk away then later on when they come back and say hey dad can I take the car you wasted your breath your breath is a waste right now because you didn't care about what I said you didn't care about what I thought. You, you want something from me? We're going to have to start with some repentance. Y'all with me yet? And so here's what the scriptures say. In the, and here's what the psalm is. It's not saying if you fail God, your prayer, you shouldn't pray. That's not what this means. And not even in the Old Testament is that what it means. What it means is if, if you don't care about what God wants from your life, then why are you telling him all the things you want from him? I mean, you... Even if it's not a waste of breath, it seems like it should be. And so the New Testament idea of that is, look, if, if you confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, right? So we have the ability to come before him and repent and get right. But I just thought it was a very interesting thing that if you turn away from what God wants of your life, then your prayer, that's your communication with God, it's not just hindered, it's stupid, don't talk to God about what you want or need until you make sure that you're in right fellowship with him. All right, that makes sense? All right. Modern day Proverbs. So we, we talked about this a minute ago. Go play in the streets, my favorite. Um, someone else said, go ahead, jump off a bridge. Go ahead and finish that for me. Because all your friends did it, right? Of course, most people don't say it that way. Most people say, if your friends jump off a bridge... See, I don't ask that because my kids will be like, yeah, it sounds fun. 
How about this one? You are what you eat. Is that a true statement? How many of you eat bananas? Are y'all bananas? See, it depends on how you, how you take the verse or how you take the proverb. You don't really become a banana. But it's not even, so that, that proverb isn't really about what you eat, although if you eat fattening foods, you'll get fat. If you eat sugar foods, you'll lose your teeth, right? But, but it re- what that proverb's really about is whatever you put in, you're going to see the effects come out. And so when you read the proverbs, you need to read them with an idea, and I hope that you'll take those notes that I gave you and look through them, especially when it comes to parallelism, where one verse, you'll see two verses in one line, and they say the same thing, just two different ways. And so if it means one thing one way, it means the same thing the other way. So if you can't harmonize them, then you're wrong. Right? So let's do this one verse I did before already. Your love, O Lord, <clears throat> reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. So faithfulness is, is attuned to what? God's love. Why? Because if God really loves you, he will be faithful to you. And if you're faithful to him, or if he's faithful to you, it's because he loves you. So your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. What's amazing is, is that we do it that way, but in the Hebrew word, um, shamayim is the word for the heavens and the sky. It's the same word. And so when you read it, they do it different words because they want you to see the poetic nature of it. But when you read any of the Proverbs, I want you to look through it and try to figure out what, if it says it two different ways, and maybe the first and the second line are exact opposites, figure out from the two, what's he really trying to say? The other thing is, is like we've talked about in every book, uh, you shouldn't read one thing. If you're going to read a proverb, read the whole thing. Now, it might, it might just be segments of a lot of sayings, so there might be no connection. But like Ecclesiastes, all connected. And so as you read any of these books, read, read more than just one or two verses. Uh, but if you find the meaning of one of the verses and you're like, oh, I got this one, then you can teach your kids the meaning of it by sh- giving them this much of it, right? Go play in the street. I know what that means, but you might not. So I'll give you the further meaning and then we'll memorize it by just remembering the short term. That's what the Proverbs and the wisdom literature does. That make sense? All right, so we're going to play a game, and then we will be uh, dismissed. And so I need my two best drawers. Oh, you got a question? I'm sorry. Any questions? So in the Proverbs, how come, like, sometimes we'll see it like a proverb that says one thing, and then oh, thank lines you for, later. Thank you for asking. Four lines later, and then it's not a proverb. And so, like, why are we reading this later? Okay. So that's, you have, actually, you have two or three things that's great about that question. Number one, let me, let me, you got to remind me of all of them, though, because there's like three in there. Uh, why do they repeat themselves? Well, because these wisdom literatures weren't written, they're, they're a collection of a lot of writings. So it's not like they were writing it thinking it would go in some Bible. They were just writing down wisdom literature and it, it all was collected together and they put it in together. That's number one. Um, that's how you started. Um, oh, man. Ask your question again. Oh, oh, the other one, um, sometimes you'll read Proverbs and it seems to conflict with the rest of the Bible. Here's, here's what I want to make sure you understand. If a proverb says something that seems to conflict with the New Testament scripture, your interpretation of what you're reading is wrong. Because nothing in wisdom, is go, in wisdom literature is going to conflict with the further understanding of the mystery, which is in the New Testament. Uh, and finally, um, when, when you read... Oh, here it is. When you read the Psalms and the Proverbs and the wisdom literature, understand this. Uh, matter of fact, I wrote it in your notes. Let me make sure you see it because it's one of those things that's uh, extremely important. Uh, in number two, wisdom in the Proverbs. Proverbs try to say, tries to say, I'm, I always have a mistake in here. All things are equal, but there is a basic attitudes and patterns of behavior that will help a person grow into a responsible adult. And then it goes on later, and I can't find it right this second, but it talks about how um, wisdom literature wasn't written um, to give theological truths or or theological aspects of God. Wisdom literature is, if if you were to look at life, here is what this wisdom person found to be true. Right? Doesn't mean it's always true. It means this is what they found to be true. 
And so as you're reading it, if you're looking at it trying to uh, prove something about God from the Psalms, for instance, we sing a song, a, a modern day hymn, uh, it's not a hymn, a modern day song, it says this, that God's love is reckless, right? Um, how's that song go, somebody? Yeah, oh, the ever-ending reckless love of God, right? It chastens me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99, right? Reckless love. Is God's love reckless? No, it's completely planned out. I mean, it's completely planned out. Does it seem reckless? Yeah, absolutely. Have you thought about what a sinner you are? And why God continues to jump hurdles for you? Why does God continue to love you despite your unbelievable um, uh, rebellion to him? I mean, it seems like it's so, like, he died on a cross, and he lets me choose anything I want to choose, and he still calls me his child. How reckless is he? He's not reckless at all. He knows how it ends and still loved me anyway. So why would anyone write a song called, and why would we sing a song called Reckless Love? Because it's not about, uh, the Psalms are not theological truths. They are the way the, the writer feels about God. So every time we sing the song Reckless Love, I always intro it by saying God is not reckless. However, he loves us so much that it seems reckless. And so to the, to the writer of a wisdom literature, this is what God seems like to him. We don't pull theological truths from any of the wisdom literature. We simply see, we see what we see. We see what they're, they're trying to say about life. And then we compare it and contrast it to what the New Testament teaches about God. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's a great question. Yes. That's what they are. Yes. Psalm 119, is, he was saying it, they, the psalms seem like hymns, and they are. That's what they are. They're, they're David's hymns, and there's five, five or six writers, they think, in the psalms. Um, but Psalm 119 especially um, has a ton of verses. And the way, and I could do the math, uh, I think there's 23 or 20, how many in English language? 26 letters? So there's 23 letters, I think, in the Hebrew alphabet, and there's eight passages, eight, eight verses in every, for every letter. And so Aleph is the first in the Hebrew alphabet. And so the first word of every, the first eight stanzas, first eight verses, all start with the word Aleph. The next eight all start with Beta. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Chet, and Tet, and Zion, right? So it has all the letters. And so you do the math, it's 23 times eight. That's how many verses there are. Here's the other thing that's cool about 119. Um, in every single one of those verses, there is a different word for the law. So there's eight words, I think, for the law uh, in the Old Testament. And so every, every verse in those eight verses has a different word for law. And so you see the word law, each word for the word law, which is eight of them, you see them 23 times. And so it's all, 20, uh, Psalm 20, uh, 119 is all about how much this author loves God's word. So again, very poetic. So it's, it's uh, what do we call that when you, uh, like an acrostic? That's, that's a Hebrew acrostic. So, again, you can do a whole research on the Psalms and figure out how they do it. But the more you know, the better you'll understand what in the world the psalmist and the proverb wisdom literature is about. So, I gave you those notes. I pray you'll walk through them at home. Look, the reason we give you those is because I know you don't all going to read the book, but at least you can read the notes. And look at the examples I've given you in there, and you can kind of, I say I, read the examples the book has given, and you can kind of look through that as well. All right. I need any other questions, first of all? All right, I need three, uh, I need you two, because y'all were the best drawers, so come on. Come on, yes ma'am. Come on, Carter, let's go. And I need, uh, I need someone who is not really, I mean, really cannot draw. Like, you just can't draw. You can't even draw a stick figure. Come on, somebody. I need somebody who can't draw a stick figure. Come on. Let me go grab my instruments. Get a pen. Hey, by the way, just for free, how many of you, when you filled out your, when you did your first drawing, how many of you wish you'd had a pencil, not a pen? Aren't you glad that when it comes to the, comes to the drawing of your life, that God forgives your sins and starts over? 
It's like drawing in pencil with an eraser. That's good stuff. All right. I need y'all three different areas. I don't, because I, here's the rules. I'm going to give you something to draw. You don't have much time. I'm going to give you about the same amount of time, about a minute, minute and a half, maybe less. And I just want you to see how much you can complete. Okay? But here's what you're going to do. You're going to show your picture uh, before you draw it. You're going to show it to everybody, but no, none of y'all can look at each other's. Okay? So we're going to see how this turns out. So if y'all will... You need a pen, yes. You need a pen or a pencil. I don't care. You can have a pencil. You're not going to have enough time to erase anything anyway, so it's fine. Take your time. We're just, we're just waiting on live. <laughs> That's so mean. All right, so again, this is the same thing as before. There will be dots. You can, uh, you, I just want you to draw in the dots, fill in the dots, create your picture. Uh, you don't have a lot of time, so just do as much as you can or do whatever you want. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it even. If it, whatever. It's up to you. Uh, this is like God giving you something to see what you'll do with it. So, but I need you to turn that way for a moment, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let everybody see what we're doing. Okay, so this, this is this one. Have I got it? Okay, don't show it to anybody. There it is right there. Okay. Yeah, don't start yet. This is this one. Yeah, got it? Everybody got it? Okay, don't let him see it. There's yours right there. Okay. And then here's this one. Everybody got it? Got it, got it. Okay. Are you giving me the trick? Here we go. You ready? What am I supposed to do with it? It's, it's, it's connect the dot, bro. It's not that hard. Are you ready? Go. I'm going to give you about 90 seconds, and we're going to see how this turns out. Anybody, who thinks they already know how this is going to turn out? Wait, don't, don't stay, over, stay over there, stay over there. Who thinks they already know how this is going to turn out? I, I already know how it's going to turn out. Okay. All right. <laughs> What's funny is, is I, thought, I thought of something really cool to do right before we did this, and it's going to change the whole way this turns out, it's, and it should be pretty awesome. All right, um, we'll give you about 30 more seconds. Any other questions, huh? Just wait, just wait, 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 and watch what happens. All right, that's good. Here we go. Here we go. Look here. Look here. So, so tell us first, what did you draw? I drew an orange. I drew an orange. Everybody see his orange? <laughs> really? Or an apple, whatever it is. That's really, that's, hey, well done, buddy. Good job. Good job. It was hard, he said. Well, it was hard enough that you made one mistake. But that's good, though. That's good. By the way, you were what you drew outside the, the you didn't touch the lines, man. You, you're supposed to touch the dots, bro. All right, let me see yours. All right. Uh, and and what is yours? It's supposed to kind of maybe be an angel. It's, oh, it's an angel. Everybody see the angel? It's an angel. Okay. All right. Let me see yours. What is yours? The Mona Lisa. Everybody got it? Now, here, here's what's really, really funny about this. Okay, here's what's really funny about this. I, I put you over here on purpose because you, uh, he thinks on a, well, you can go see him. He thinks on a different level than the rest of us. If y'all don't know that, he does. I gave this to him upside down. Right? If, if you'd have seen this upside down, you would have had no idea. I would have had no, I'd have been like, what? What is that supposed to be? But... He, he turned it back right side up and began to do it. And even though he was, he did touch some dots. Let's don't lie. He touched some dots. Um, that looks like um, a KKK member, I'm just saying. <laughs> but here's the thing. And, and this one looks like Casper the Friendly Ghost. But here's what I wanted to point out to you. Most people who don't know the Lord, if they don't know the Lord and they open the Bible, and they read from the wisdom literature. It's a lot like getting something like this, upside down, ton of dots, no directions, no idea what in the world you're doing. And they just, here's the thing, you can make this turn out to anything you want it to be. And then you'll say, well, I learned it from the Bible. Because you have no wisdom, no Holy Spirit to teach you. And so you're just connecting dots best way you can. Or, you can be this Christian. This Christian reads the Bible all the time. Oh my gosh, they're all over the Bible. And they're trying really hard to follow the rules in every way, shape, and form. 
But you know what this person normally does? This person gets fed up and tired and say, I can't do it, God. It's too much for me. It's too hard. I can't do all this. I can't even see the numbers. What am I supposed to do with this? And we end up quitting because it's too hard. Here's what's amazing. Neither one of these is what God wants from your life. What God wants is for you to take one passage at a time, one book at a time, one idea at a time, and just begin to allow God to connect dots in your life. And you may say, but John, that's so simple. I mean, what can I learn about God like this? It's not about that. It's about allowing God to connect little dots in your life, and before you know it, if you connect the dots in a little bit, a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, a little bit the next day, when your life is over, God will have created a masterpiece in you. Greater than any Mona Lisa ever could be, because Mona Lisa is the same. We all think, oh, I know that picture, I know that picture. When, you're, when God's done with you, you won't even know what it is he's done. But he will have created a one-of-a-kind a one of a kind image of Jesus Christ in you. So maybe today, he just wants you to read the Word, read some wisdom, read, read through the Bible, understand what you're reading as we've walked through how to read the Bible for all it's worth. Read whatever you're going to read. Read it for the glory of God and do it for this purpose. Let God show you, you know, John, today I just want you to draw the eyelid. It's not hard. Look, it's just three dots. Just, I'm going to help you connect these dots. Tomorrow we're just going to work on the bridge of the nose. The next day we're going to work on the other bridge. Next day we're going to work on the next eye. And before your life's over, you will be a masterpiece of God. Don't overdo yourself. Oh, I've got to follow it all. No, just spend time with God every day. Walk in tune with the Spirit and let God connect the dots of your life. Because wisdom is taking God's truths and applying them to your life one dot at a time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for this study, even though it's been difficult. God, I thank you that, that we're trying to learn how to read your word for all that it's worth. God, I pray that tonight we've uh, finished this out strong. And God, I pray that as we walk through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John next week, God, I pray that we would use everything we've learned this year, everything we learned this summer, and we would put them back into application to apply your scriptures to our life. God, we pray that you would help us to connect the dots, that we could make sense of your word and apply it significantly to our life, that we might live a life of wisdom as we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mentors, if you're a, ma a male mentor, if you'll stand up, we're going to um, break out into groups tonight. So one, two, three, four, uh, four of you. So if you're a, a male, if you'll go to one of these guys and get in their group, um, females, if you're a female mentor, if you'll stand, wait, don't move yet, Sid, you look like a woman now. Female mentors, one, two, three, Lori, are you standing? Four, five, okay, so there, there's the men lady mentors, ladies, you can find one of them. Let me tell you how we do this. Oh, and, and Cedric, if, uh, if you're a college or career under 30, uh, you can go to Cedric's group. Um, that's Cedric right back there, raise your hand, Cedric. Um, and so um, these, the purpose of these groups is to talk about what we've talked about. Listen, please don't go home. The, the reason we do what we do is to teach it and then talk about it. And uh, hopefully you'll build accountability, you'll gain some friends, because we're not just a church, we are family. And so use this as family time. And if nothing else, before you leave, make sure you pray over one another and uh, just find out something about somebody you didn't know today. And uh, so go to your group time. Thank you for coming tonight. God bless you. I will see you Sunday morning.